Dog will get replaced by Tabler down the line completely. So I don't think in my career it will. Um, I think that what we are going to see first is that certain patient populations, mm -hmm. they will go to Tabler and that's just, if you're 80 years old, there is not going to be a huge advantage to having a phenotomy and going on bypass. The question right now is durability. So what we know about regular surgical valves is that it's about 7.8 years before we start to see degeneration, okay? So if, if this valve that we know at five years looks equal to surgical valves, if we can say that it's the same at seven, 10 years, it could easily replace that for an older patient population. The problem is, am I willing today to put that valve in someone who's 60? I only have five year data. Right? I would want 20-year data. Right. Um, even the surgical valves, we know initial fall-off starts at 7.8 years, and average lifespan, somewhere between, between 12 and 17 years. Right, That's about how much time. Younger patients are going to wear those out sooner, sooner, older patients is going to last longer. So if you're 65 today, you may think you want a transcatheter valve, but what are you treating? You're treating higher pacemaker rate, you're trading this question of durability. So until we have those answers, I don't know. I definitely think for 80 year olds, high risk patients, Tower will be, will, will, already has replaced it. Um, for patients who are intermediate risk, we <coughs> will see you next month at the AATS, American, or American Cardiology Conference, or whatever it's, um, uh, ACC, sorry, I'm brain fart here. Um, that will tell us a lot. Because if, if at one year it's the same as surgery, it's hard to justify. Because these patients do very well with surgery, and we know we're putting valves in that are going to last 17 years. Um, the other thing is the price. A traditional surgical valve, depending on which one you use, is somewhere between two and five thousand dollars. Five thousand on a really high end, and there aren't very many that uh, are that expensive. The transcatheter valve is thirty-five thousand um, dollars. Got it down to about 33, but you're talking about putting a $35,000 valve in somebody for the difference of what advantage you're going to get. So we don't know that answer today. Germany says yes. Germany says transcatheter valve for everyone. Okay. Can I follow up with another question? Sure. sure. So uh, I actually work with uh, Marcus Stutter, Dr. Stutter, on uh, AS subjects. We have a uh, IRB approved study to do MRI in patients with AS. So he tells me that the uh, criterion for severe AS is uh, uh, basically uh, EOA uh, less than uh, one centimeter squared. You had a 0.6 centimeter squared. So I was just that's that's uh, 0.6 if you're looking at um, their body. their body weight. So that's indexed. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, if you do their index, so it's oops, uh, if you do their index, then it is. So initial criteria here, aortic valve barrier less than one centimeter squared. Okay, okay, I didn't see that. Right? Okay, right, right, right. Then you have your velocity criteria, your gradient right. criteria, or index right. to their body size. Okay, okay. And actually, another question. Uh, what percentage of uh, the, uh, the valves that you put in uh, through TAVR are uh, ferromagnetic? And, uh, because you mentioned that there's a... <coughs> ferromagnetic that are coming online? Is that, is that um, maybe There a are some, right. but for a different problem. So all of them right now are. Right. Right? We oversize them. They are held on by friction right. um, and radial force. That's it. Um, but they, we can do that because the, out, the, the aorta is calcified and the leaflets are calcified. For patients who have aortic insufficiency, they may not have any calcium in the valve, but the valve just leaks. So instead of being too tight, it leaks. Right. That's a different problem because oftentimes that's because the annulus itself is getting big, like that mitral regurgitation. Right. There are companies coming out with valves that grab onto the leaflets to try to fix that problem. Um, and so that's a little bit different design. Nothing is FDA approved yet. I see. Yes, sir. Um, could you uh, uh, just elaborate for me, uh, just my curiosity on like what steps are being taken during surgery to help prevent future complications from like you mentioned stroke, increased stroke risk? Okay. Yeah, 
Is it, is, is it really as simple as you said, it's just kind of, kind of net that you kind of put in there? Yes. Um, so here's the issue, though. Um, so let me, I'm going to go back to, if I can find it, um, I'm going to go back to this. Okay. So when the stroke risk was higher than surgery, right, and we accepted the stroke risk in surgery being somewhere between 3 and 5%. So open surgery, 3 to 5% risk of stroke. And we said, okay, that's fine. The initial study showed stroke rates were like 10%, right? And we said, well, that's not so good. So the device got smaller, we got better at it, and now the stroke rate is less than 1%. It's 0.8%. So during that time when stroke rates were high, there were a whole host of ideas that came out. Well, what if we first put little baskets in the carotid arteries and it would catch all the debris? And what if we made a deflector that we just put across? So blood could go through during the procedure, but any big chunks, well, they would just go to the toes. Those were tried. But now that it's not a problem anymore, it's hard to justify doing more things for a stroke rate of less than 1%. Oh. Yeah, but those are still those are still in trial. I'm sure we'll find a use for them somewhere. Sure. With respect to um, Taver, how much of it is a function of fitting something circular in something that's not circular versus um, you have a patient under sedation, and so their blood pressure is lower, and so the annulus itself is smaller. And well, so we do ours away punches. now, yeah. and and so that that difference doesn't make a huge. I mean, when when we did general anesthesia versus conscious sedation, there's not a lot of difference. Um, we base the sizing on a CT scan, right? So systole and diastole, and we base it on the largest size. Um, and then we 10% oversize. It's kind of sort of the rule. Each device kind of has its, these other little features about it, but by and large, 10% oversizing gives you enough radial force to hold the valve in place. Um, and it's all based on the size on the CT scan. So all of that is decided before we get to the operating room. And in terms of the um, pacing issue, is it because it touches a particular spot, or is it because it's throughout the annulus, or yeah. what is it? Because So um, I don't have a picture here, but yes. The conduction system mm -hmm. uh, sits right. Actually, I can I can show you that picture of, of the bottom. It has a, it, it will show, uh, can point to it. Um, so if we go back to this picture. Um, imagine that this mitral valve and this aortic valve here they look like they're touching. In in actuality, there's a fibrous skeleton and it's called a curtain. The conduction system, the node, sits right there. So what happens is, as we put the valve in and we push underneath of the aortic valve, that node gets irritated. And whether it gets stretched, whether it gets injured, once that happens, the electrical circuitry that goes down through the heart muscle itself then stops. If we're lucky, it's transient. If we're unlucky, they will have no rhythm or have just a ventricular rhythm. And so their heart rate will be in the 20s or 30s because the only thing that's happening is that the ventricle contracts on itself because the pace setter is actually on the atrial side and it should send the signal to the ventricle and then go through the ventricle. But if we knock out this, atrium's doing what it's doing, ventricle, ventricle is going 20 beats per minute and that's not compatible with life. And if there's no other question, I just have one other thing. Has there been any approaches for the mitral valves? Has there been any approach to reshape the annulus? Because especially when it's not touching, instead of trying to grab, you know, has there been any effort to reshape the annulus, uh, either surgically, and does it work? And if, <coughs> if it works surgically, do you think there's a way to do yeah. it catheter base? And, and that is... Um, that I, I didn't get into that because this presentation was already so long, but yes. Okay. So surgically, for functional, that type two mitral regurgitation, that's exactly what we do. I would, I would stop the heart, open the atrium, um, and so I'd open this chamber, go in and put a ring around the valve. So I would take that annulus and pull it back in because the heart, the part that is attached to the aorta and the septum doesn't move, that's the anterior leaflet. The posterior part will come in because that's the free wall of the heart. So I can actually pull that up by putting a metal ring around it and just sewing that around. 
So that is what the treatment is for functional mitral regurgitation when it's severe. The problem is, surgically, it treats the symptoms, but no survival advantage has ever been proven from it. Because so, it keeps dilating. Because the rest of the heart keeps failing. Exactly. Um, in terms of uh, other approaches percutaneously, there are, there are quite a few ideas of what if we could go in and instead of having to sew around that annulus, what if we could take almost like a ribbon and if we grab the tissue in multiple places and then pull that ribbon, it would bring it together. Well, it turns out it tears. Um, well, they came up with all these other ways to try to fix something there that you, that you could then change the size. The problem is the heart's still beating, so you're grabbing tissue that's moving. Um, and we haven't figured out a good way, but there are lots and lots of ideas. Just as many ideas of how to put a valve inside of there, there are just as many ideas of how to repair it. One last question. Is, you may, this is such a <coughs> The clipped mitral valve, do you have an estimate on what the efficiency of that is compared to normal? Obviously, it's better than a diseased one that's regurgitating because you're, you're closing it off in the middle, where, which is where it's usually opening. Correct. Um, so, um, efficiency, I don't know the answer to. Well, how, how close does it? Um, so, what, what we, you can't use this device on anyone with a normal size annulus because then you would trade regurgitation for stenosis. And stenosis is worse for these patients, especially a patient who's had a leaky valve for so long. If you immediately make it too tight and nothing can come out of the atrium, then you're in horrible heart failure. So the annulus has to be large enough for us to cut in half to begin with. So what we're looking for is an annulus that's already big enough, three and a half to four centimeters, so that when we cut it in half, we still have normal size annulus. So a normal size valve is going to be, like if I put in a, a replacement valve, I'll put in like a 27, 27 millimeter. So what we end up with is two 25s from a four. And I, I know the math doesn't equal, but it's, it's orifice area. Um, and uh, what we're more concerned with is what is our gradient afterwards. Um, so we are using gradient for function. So we go from a wide open valve we want a gradient that's like two millimeters of mercury or four millimeters of mercury. If we got to a gradient, we made it small enough where it was in the double digits. Anything over eight, the patient's going to do worse. So it doesn't exactly answer your question, but. Any other questions? Thank you so much.